Hello everyone, welcome to yours and mine favorite part of the week. That's right, it's developmental psychology lecture time. This week we're talking about intelligence and creativity, so let's jump right into it. So like every psychological concept that we talk about in this class and that you've encountered so far, uh, there is no one precise definition of anything. And this is particularly true when it comes to intelligence. So psychologists can't agree on a precise definition of intelligence. Uh, one psych a psychologist named Edward Boring, uh, he, his quote is that intelligence is whatever intelligence tests measure. But with that said, we're going to walk, to, walk through uh, different approaches to intelligence and different ways of assessing intelligence, intelligence, beginning with the psychometric approach, which spawned the development of standardized tests of intelligence. And they define intelligence as a trait or a set of traits that characterizes some people to a greater extent than others. Goal is to identify these traits precisely and measure them. So what we have here is intelligence, again, being this kind of trait, this characteristic um, that's constant across um, all or most, if not all, uh, circumstances that sticks with an individual. And, this, and the way to um, measure that is through the administration of tests that are standardized and that you can administer across all populations and across kind of like all historical periods. And kind of two uh, famous uh, scientists with this approach is uh, Bennett and Simon, and they devised a large battery of tasks, and they were commissioned by the French government to, to devise a task to identify, quote, dull children who might need additional instructions in classrooms. They devised tasks which they thought were necessary to classroom learning. Attention, perception, memory, reasoning, verbal, and comprehension uh, tasks were included in the tests. They were the forerunners of the modern IQ test. And they came up with the idea of this mental age, uh, which is the level of age-graded problems that a child is able to solve. Five-year-olds are expected to be able to solve tasks for five-year-olds. So if you gave, just kind of a, to expand on this point a little bit, uh, if you gave uh, five-year-olds a set of problems, some that uh, a five-year-old could solve, some a six-year-old could solve, seven-year-old, and just etc. Uh, you would expect the child, uh, if they were um, properly uh, develop, uh, developing uh, intellectually, according to this theory of in intelligence, uh, to be able to complete those tasks assigned to five-year-olds. Um, and as you can see, there are particular uh, types of tasks, and there's kind of um, components of intelligence that this um, these intelligence tasks uh, test. So, um, you know, they have a uh, theoretical uh, lens where they perceive attention, perception, memory, reasoning, and verbal and comprehension as the key components of intelligence. Next, let's, let's talk about test norms, which are standards of normal performance expressed as average scores in the range of scores around the average across all ages. And we'll get into kind of the most common example of that momentarily. They're based on a performance of a large representative sample, and mental age is no longer used to calculate IQ. Uh, and now um, the psychometric approaches intelligence uh, compare intelligence with others of the same age. Distribution of scores. Normal distribution is a symmetrical bell-shaped uh, spread around the score, uh, in this case uh, 100. The standard deviation is the measure of the variability that takes into account how far each data point is from the mean, how tightly the scores are clustered around the mean score. Nearly 95% of uh, test takers or uh, individuals on a particular task have scores between 70 and 130 um, on this IQ uh, uh, study, uh, uh, task, I should say. And fewer than 3% have scores of 130 or above, criterion of giftedness. So kind of the idea here, and this is a classic uh, bell-shaped curve uh, with a nice little peak in the middle and then the tails of the distribution they're called, that is the left and the right end, uh, kind of slowly extending uh, to the far ends of the distribution. In the case of an average IQ score, uh, they scaled, uh, they, they um, scaled it, it's called, um, their test so that the average test score is uh, 100. And kind of a uh, couple stats, points here. Uh, when we talk about variance, variability, spread of the data, what well, we're talking about is standard deviation. And as I stated, that's how much uh, data, uh, how far uh, each data point is from the mean. So you can be one standard deviation above the mean, which means you're scoring better on the task, or one standard deviation below the mean, 
uh, which means you would be scoring below the test, but there are also, you know, obviously more than one standard deviation. There's one, two, three, uh, et cetera. And basically the idea here is, um, and I should say, uh, each standard deviation away from the mean kind of represents um, uh, what percentile in which you are scoring on a particular task, in this case, your IQ score. And as I stated, 95% uh, of uh, test takers on this IQ test score between 70 and 130. And pretty much all graders and test score and test creators are trying to create this distribution of scores within their task, or uh, with yeah within their task, their study, or even in their class, trying to have a nice bell curve, um, to, to uh, which indicates that your task is reliably um, identifying differences uh, within your within this uh, particular sample. In contrast to the psychometric approach, where kind of there's this one uh, uh, intelligence, uh, sometimes referred to as G or S, um, Gardner argues and rejects uh, IQ test scores as a measure of human intelligence. He argues that they're entirely different domains of intellectual skill. Individuals have each type of intelligence to varying degrees and prefer to learn and process information in different ways. Gardner's quote, frames of minds uh, are different ways of thinking about the world. Each frame of mind is different and fully independent intelligence in its own right. Argues that there is neurological evidence that distinct types of intelligence relate to distinct structures slash networks in the brain. So we're going to cover the uh, specific types of intelligence momentarily. But kind of the idea here is, as stated, that an individual can be uh, score uh, on a hypothetical test score um, uh, high on one um, domain of intelligence and lower on another domain of intelligence. And thus there's not one sole intelligence or, or one IQ test score. And uh, he points to uh, uh, neuroimaging data uh, in particular brain uh, regions and kind of more specifically brain networks uh, wherein um, different brain networks are activated to perform well on particular tasks thus kind of giving a neurological evidence of different uh, quote-unquote in human intelligence is um, in support for his theory. And here are the different types of intelligence. Uh, I didn't, I'm not going to walk through all of them, but you can kind of see here their uh, musical intelligence and then something like um, an, an, uh, interpersonal intelligence. So you can imagine someone who's really good at a guitar, but really bad at uh, maintaining communication in a friendship, for example. Uh, Gardner has also uh, considered a ninth type of intelligence, and that's a, a existentialist uh, intelligence, which is the ability to grasp deep philosophical ideas, such as the meaning of life. So again, kind of the idea here is that there's these uh, eight or nine uh, components of intelligence, some people argue for more, uh, where people uh, vary on their um, uh, proficiency within these domains of intelligence, and thus there is not just one single um, IQ, and thus not one single kind of IQ test score that uh, fully captures uh, the extent and the abilities of an individual. In a similar vein, uh, Sternberg argues for a, tri a triarchic theory of successful intelligence. And that triarchy theory is made up of practical, creative, and analytic intelligence. To fully assess intelligence, researchers must consider the practical, uh, the pra uh, practical context, that is age, culture, and historical period, ability to respond creatively to new tasks, and their analytical uh, strategies. So this is kind of going back almost to um, Vygalsky's uh, theory, kind of tying this in. Uh, wherein uh, particular cultures emphasize particular cognitive strategies uh, based on the values within that culture. So to kind of measure one uh, global IQ test that tests you know, specific uh, abstract problem solving skills uh, would be an inaccurate um, representation of that uh, particular culture's uh, intelligence. And you also have to consider the historical period uh, because different technologies emerge where we interact with different things on a uh, daily basis. Uh, thus requiring uh, different problem solving skills emphasized in particular historical eras and other skills maybe be, uh, being uh, de-emphasized. And uh, you also have to consider the um, age of an individual because among obvious kind of things, um, but uh, the age of an individual, uh, the, 
the responsibilities and the cognitive strategies associated with that person uh, will differ by will differ compared to other uh, older adults. And again, kind of similar to this um, um, Vygalsky uh, idea of intelligence, where younger adults or younger children, I should say, uh, are kind of scaffolded by their um, elders um, uh, in their uh, group. Uh, and that's how intelligence is passed down. So you can kind of see here that you're considering age, culture, historical period, um, the ability to solve creative tasks with any particular uh, environment, and kind of your um, analytical, particular analytical strategies. But let's go into the specifics of each uh, component a little more. Beginning with the practical component, what is defined as intelligent, intelligent behavior varies depending on the social cultural context. People can adapt to the environment that they find themselves in, and they can shape the environment to optimize their strengths and, weak, and minimize their weaknesses. It emphasizes street smarts and the ability to solve real-world problems. Intelligence changes over time. Numerical abilities may not play an important role in intelligent behavior today. So kind of the idea here is that you have to consider the context that an individual is uh, developing in and uh, resides in. And uh, thus, uh, particular forms of adaptation within particular environments um, may be uh, useful. So the same type of adaptation can be more useful, I should say, in uh, one environment compared to another. So you can imagine um, uh, living in a very poor area versus uh, with uh, high degrees of war, or violence, or poverty, and compared to uh, affluent uh, suburban uh, community. And the uh, types of kind of strategies you use to navigate through the world is is uh, more adaptive. If adaptive, you know, it's contributing to your survival. Um, and one, uh, you know, in a uh, war torn region, those strategies may be different. Those that those types of intelligence may be different. Those uh, components, you know, of intelligence that are necessary to survive within that environment to adapt to that environment are, you know, expected to be different than living in the suburbs. Um, not only that, but the ability to shape uh, the environment to optimize your strength and minimize your weaknesses. So recognizing your strength and weaknesses, and then um, kind of going back to the one of the key points of the Sternberg theory is your ability to uh, respond creatively to new tasks and have analytic strategies. And in this case, wherein you recognize your strengths and weaknesses and kind of shape the environment to meet those strengths and weaknesses. So kind of uh, working to secure a goodness of fit um, in within your environment as a component of intelligence, and thus intelligence uh, changes over time because it really revolves around solving real world problems and street smarts, which obviously are the kind of uh, the components of intelligence um, to navigate uh, those real world problems and. and uh, and kind of street smarts will change over time because the real world problems will be different over time. Thus, your the what is classified as street smarts 500 years ago will be uh, different today. And kind of one example today is kind of numerical abilities, um, maybe uh, being de-emphasized today, so maybe less emphasis on standard uh, multiplication. But something else being different, maybe uh, in an era of social media where you see a lot of like graphs or stuff like that, maybe statistical analysis being uh, more uh, useful in solving real world problems and kind of navigating your environment uh, being more useful in today's historical context than a hundred, uh, whatever, a few hundred years ago when you did not have calculators or cash registers, etc. And kind of understanding bar graphs floating on your social media was not really a thing that existed. The creative component. What is intelligence when a person first encounters a new task is not the same as what is intelligent after an extensive experience. Novel tasks are the best way to measure intelligence because they tap into the ability to come up with creative ideas or fresh insights, composing an emotional, moving poem or exquisite piece of music. Automization. There's increased uh, efficiency of information processing with practice. Sternberg argues that it is critical to know how familiar a task is to a person before assessing that person's behavior. Cultural biases are introduced when administering tasks, which which one group is familiar with. So kind of the let's work our way through this. And kind of the idea here is that Sternberg is arguing it's more important. Well, first of all, it's different. Um, uh, kind of a different measure of, you know, quote unquote intelligence. 
uh, if you're dealing with somebody who has taken, for example, an, an IQ uh, test score or an IQ test, uh, it's different. Uh, uh, what what people are bringing to the table is different when they when they uh, interact with an IQ test. Uh, so an individual who's maybe taken it 50 times are bringing. Um, an amount, uh, a large amount of experience with that task. They know what kind of questions are typically asked on the test. They may have particular problem-solving strategies. Uh, maybe they've uh, taken um, courses on how to uh, perform well on this particular intelligence test. So say the SAT, uh, the GRE, which is a test to get into uh, graduate school programs, um, MCAT, whatever, etc. But kind of the idea here is that there's a difference um, in how you should understand um, intelligence because of this experience that an individual is uh, bringing to the table. And Sternberg argues that novel tasks where, where uh, individuals are, are um, experiencing uh, or encounter, encountering a particular task for the first time is uh, the best way to measure intelligence because it, comes, because it relies on your ability to creatively problem solve uh, you know, on on the fly, and it, it, going back to that first fly, slide, uh, Sternberg felt that as a critical component of intelligence. And one reason for that is because you're really not, you know, quote unquote, you know, whatever intelligence you know means. Um, definition varies, but um, your or what you're really testing, kind of quote unquote true intelligence, whatever that is, or kind of just your ability to perform well in a particular task that you've. Um, have acquired, uh, that you have extensive experience with. And kind of the idea here with automization is that uh, as you perform a task over time, um, you, uh, on a neurological level, it becomes more automated. And this is kind of represented through myelination uh, that we talked about throughout this course. So therefore, at, the, at that point, you're really not even kind of thinking and problem solving things through on um, in, in an effortful way. You're really just kind of relying on uh, unconscious um, automization processes within the brain. So imagine like driving, you can imagine driving the first time where you're really focused and you're trying to like focus on every little detail and how difficult that is versus you're daydreaming now driving home and all of a sudden, oh, oh shit, I'm home now and it's I'm on, been on a two hour drive. So those kind of, uh, that's kind of a neurological evidence or kind of approach to his theory that it's a it's a different type of uh, cognitive component that you're that you're measuring when you're measuring someone who has this more automatic process versus um, a more manual effortful full process which is reflective of their uh, experience within um, interacting with that particular uh, task and which and um, embedded within that um, experience with with a particular task is a cultural bias, right? Because particular cultures would interact with um, particular tasks more often than others. If you're from Florida, you've taken, you know, multiple standardized tests of FCAT growing up, so you kind of have a kind of general idea of what kind of questions are asked. Versus, you know, you minister that to um, a Maasai uh, tribe in, in Kenya they're going to have never seen this kind of task in their life, most likely, or at least, you know, uh, this exact version of this task. Uh, thus, you're bringing a different uh, amount of experience to the table, which are kind of culturally biased, uh, because one, one culture is um, interacting with that task more than others, and also um, it's uh, because of that, actually, um, the test is kind of designed uh, with uh, based on um, and emphasizing particular cognitive strategies uh, within a particular culture and that culture not being <laughs> the Maasai in Kenya. And finally the analytic component. This is the ability to reason logically or quote book smarts, bar smarts which are related to IQ tests, college admission exams. He argued it's only one component of intelligence and not necessarily the most crucial and focuses on the information processing skills that produce question, answers to questions in traditional intelligence tests, thinking critically and analytically. So this is kind of the traditional uh, way that people think about intelligence uh, through these IQ tests and college admission exams, such as SAT, GRE, which I've already spoken about. 
Uh, but uh, Sternberg argues that this is just one component of intelligence. It's not necessarily the first one for all the reasons that we talked about. And, you know, me personally, I just kind of given a little funny anecdote. When I was trying to get into grad school, um, uh, and I went to uh, a local state college instead of going uh, for my undergraduate degree, um, for my AA, I should say, um, instead of... Um, uh, going to a university, I had really no f uh, familiarity with uh, standardized testing besides like some FCAT stuff, but I'd never taken the SAT or anything like that. So when I was finishing up at uh, University of Central Florida and I was taking uh, my GRE and, and I decided to take a, a practice uh, test and I bombed that shit, like horrible, horrible. And uh, so I paid an outrageous amount of price. Um, threw that on the credit card, uh, to um, pay for a, uh, whatever it was, one of the training courses of GRE. And my score, like, uh, went up, it was some astronomical figure, like times six within, like, X amount of months, so some two or two months or so. But the idea here is, again, that my inexperience with those tests, even understanding how to take them, um, was so low that it was just dragging my my score down and just kind of with repetition to working through particular strategies of test taking strategies i was able to all of a sudden have this higher intelligence um that you know makes you rep represents your ability to uh lo logic re uh reason logically and whatever all those other components that the test um uh, says and measures so it's good, again kind of an example of your, would you, the experience you bring to the table uh, matters when, in, when interacting with these types of tests. So for successful intelligence, uh, Sternberg argued to establish and achieve reasonable goals consistent with your skills and circumstances, historical, social, geographic, and economic. You optimize your strength and, and minimize weaknesses, adapt to the environment through a combination of selecting a good environment and making modifications to yourself or the environment to increase fit. And you use all three components of intelligence. So kind of the idea here is you have to consider where you live, the historical moment you live in your uh, economic circumstances. It's very different uh, what your goals, reasonable goals are. Uh, living in you, the Amazonian jungle are going to be different than um, the, the suburbs of whatever, of uh, some American city. Um, your the goals that you're going for are going to be different, but the goals that are possibly achievable given a, a particular uh, so, uh, circumstances are going to be different. So uh, uh, some uh, uh, person living uh, in the Amazon, uh, Amazonian jungle having uh, are probably less likely to become rich on the stock market. Just for an example, if that was some hypothetical goal. Um, and as stated, uh, you should, uh, an individual who is successful in intelligence optimizes their strengths and minimizes their weaknesses. And kind of to do that is that you adapt to your environment um, through a combination of selecting your best environment, so finding environments that uh, optimize your strengths and minimize your weaknesses, but also making modifications to your environments uh, to increase your envir person environment fit. But within reason, right? You have to understand your historical, social, and economic conditions. Um, it can be uh, particularly more uh, easy in some uh, historical periods, or it can be more difficult in other uh, period, uh, historical periods to uh, change, modify uh, your environment. And finally, as I stated, uh, using all three components of intelligence is critical for successful intelligence, according to Stormberg. So kind of next, the book went into a little more detail on creativity, and I felt that it was... Um, uh, necessary and some 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 uh, good information. So I'm going to cover this. Um, often creativity is often measured using tests of divergent thinking that is outside the box thinking, which is capacity to generate many different solutions to a problem where there is no single answer. So uses for objects tests. Participants must generate as many uses for an ordinary object like a paper clip or a brick as they can. First is convergent thinking, which is finding the single best answer to a problem. The capacity to find the best answer to the problem want to know the correct answer and is only mildly co correlated with an IQ. Uh, so kind of the idea here, this is kind of like a life hacks kind of thing here, divergent thinking. So you're presented with an item and you're asked, um, um, generate as many uses as possible for this item. So whatever, you have a paper clip, you can poke stuff with it, you can fly it around like a helicopter, I mean, whatever. 
versus convergent thinking, which is kind of the traditional test taking uh, methods in uh, Western context where we just focus on this one correct answer and the idea is you've got to find the correct answer um, and it's much more dichotomous. And I put quotes around only mildly correlated with IQ because the textbooks I, I thought did a, poor, a pretty poor job of characterizing uh, correlation coefficients, sometimes claiming that the same a correlation coefficient, uh, characterizing it as mod in some cases, and then other cases kind of indicating that it offers moderate or strong evidence. So I mean, it's kind of just something to uh, keep in mind. Uh, kind of the thing about these uh, characterizations of correlation coefficients is that it's not an exact science, and statistics isn't, you know, there's kind of an art to it. Um, but without getting into too much detail, the idea here is that there's really not a set like this is a low correlation, this is a high correlation, this is a medium, this is immediate large. Like there's obviously some obvious ones like point, you know, zero or point um, or point nine, for example, for being a high uh, correlation. Um, but uh, oh, everything in between is there's a lot of uh, room for interpretation and uh, even the characterization are not consistent. Some people just say low, medium, high. Some people say low, medium, medium, high. And there's, uh, so there's uh, it's not agreed upon. So it's just something to keep in mind um, how um, particular co correlation coefficients are characterized with a chapter. And I feel like the book inconsistently, you can pick a scale, but just consistently um, uh, characterize uh, your cor uh, correlation coefficients within that scale. And I feel like it, they, uh, the authors um, often fluctuated their uh, characterizations of cor correlation coefficients within this chapter in particular. And kind of to wrap up uh, this kind of conceptual uh, po uh, point of the lecture, uh, fluid and crystallized intelligence. Fluid intelligence is the ability to use your mind actively to solve novel problems and the capacity to learn new ways of solving problems. First time we try and solve something, believed to represent raw information processing power. First is crystallized intelligence, which is acquired through schooling and other life experiences. The accumulated knowledge of the world we gain over time. What is the freezing temperature of Celsius? So we kind of have just ability to solve novel problems um, and kind of this raw notion of, of, of uh, intelligence or this raw information processing model, kind of similar to like a CPU, uh, where you're just um, trying to trying something, solving something, um, and your success on in doing so is uh, reflective of your capacity, this raw processing capacity to solve novel problems versus crystallized intelligence, which is basically just information you've acquired through life experience and schooling. It's your accumulation of knowledge and it's kind of uh, much more fact-based. So how many states there are, uh, what year did uh, Florida become uh, part of the United States, for example. Looking at infants' um, uh, measures of intelligence, the uh, classic one is Bailey Scales of Infant Development. And it's a measure of infant intelligence and there are uh, a couple components to this and it's uh, there's a motor scale which is the ability to do physical things like throw a ball and the cognitive scale which is assesses how the young child thinks and reacts to typical events such as searching for a hidden toy and following directions and also there's a behavioral rating scale which rates the ch children's preverbal communication and vocabulary skills uh, and then there's a general general adaptive composite which summarizes how well or how per, poorly the children performs in comparison with a large norm group. So kind of the idea here is you take these different components and make it into like one standard score and then you compare uh, an infant's score, their component score on the task compared to others uh, by kind of using the that bell curve that we talked about before, seeing where the child lies on the bell curve and what kind of percentile they are scoring in, um, on this task. And you can see here the types of intelligence that are being measured really um, uh, differ by age. So this is kind of a good example of uh, the Sternberg idea that um, there are different uh, components of intelligence at, at different ages. In this case, we have motor skills, cognitive skills, and um, kind of uh, verbal um, or vocab skill and vocab skills. The correlations between infant uh, IQ and child IQ are low. Infant tests and IQ tests tap different kinds of abilities 
infant's tasks uh, measure sensory motor skills versus verbal reasoning, abstract abilities, and problem solving. Maturational forces may also explain low correlations, may pull children back on course. Attention better, uh, is a better predictor of later IQ. So these uh, scores on Bailey's tests are, not su are pretty low, uh, uh, are, low, are correlated on a low level um, with uh, child IQ test scores. And uh, author, um, some scholars argue that it's because they're really tapping into different abilities. So it's kind of difficult and may not be expected to uh, be correlated with future child uh, IQ test scores. Uh, there may also be maturational problems. So if there's kind of develop or uh, maturation forces, I should say. So if there are uh, kind of any development delays, maybe uh, their corrective or um, uh, environmental factors that um, allow the child to undergo catch-up um, development, uh, thus making um, that original measure of Bailey on the Bailey uh, IQ score less correlated with a future child test score, uh, IQ test score, I should say, uh, because there's so many environmental forces interacting with a child's development through many years, um, which will kind of make the Bailey's uh, test score unreliable in predicting uh, future uh, IQ test scores, just because there's so many other variables that aren't being measured when considering um, the de developmental trajectory of an individual following their being administered uh, a Bailey's uh, test. And attention is thought to better predict uh, later IQ. And kind of, this is kind of like straightforward. So if you're able, the more you're able to pay attention in school, for example, or pay attention to your parents who are maybe directing you to uh, relevant information and interacting with, with you in a particular way, uh, contributing that, that attention could, uh, would be expected to contribute to, and is, is uh, contributed, uh, correlated with um, cognitive development, social development, and just paying attention more in class, which allows you to kind of interact with these uh, kind of the strategies that are often that are um, tested in these IQ test scores because schooling um, um, kind of tries to prepare student or students uh, to perform well on standardized testing by emphasizing particular cognitive strategies. Thus, paying attention to those strategies, those practices in school are beneficial to performing well on those tasks in childhood. Stability of IQ scores during childhood. Around age four, on average, there's a fairly strong relationship between early and later IQ test scores. Many children show ups and downs in their IQ scores over the course of childhood. One out of four children show greater than 10 point swings on test retests in one study. 10 uh, IQ scores are influenced by motivation, testing procedures, and skills being tested by the, uh, tested by the test. So kind of the idea here is that um, although uh, IQ test scores are kind of are, are pretty stable um, as a child advances through childhood. Uh, we still see 25% of children seeing wild fluctuations in um, IQ test scores, which uh, for a lot of reasons that we're going to get to momentarily, but also which are in this slide and that's motivation. So kind of straightforward. If you're not motivated to take the test, you're probably going to perform worse in it the testing procedures, and we'll cover that a little more throughout this chapter, and skills being tested by the test. So kind of, again, going back to the competing theories of intelligence with different components being, uh, different aspects of intelligence being tested. Um, obviously, uh, reflect, um, and if you, according to uh, Sternberg or uh, Gardner, um, if you're testing a particular uh, component of intelligence, um, an individual will score um, uh, differently than if they're tested on different components. So enter intelligence test, for example, versus musical intelligence, or coming back to the Sternberg example, creativity versus analytical intelligence. So the test, so what the test is scoring uh, matters obviously to how you define your intelligence score. Economic predictors of adverse child developmental outcomes. Uh, the first is child poverty. Uh, and that's the one I really want to focus on um, um, for the purpose of this chapter. And that's children in, un in unstable homes are have most fluctuation in scores. It involves low levels of meeting ch children's basic needs, inadequate health, nutrition, overcrowding, chronic stress, affectionate parenting, and lack of opportunity for cognitive stimulation slash practice. 
rats in rat park um, undergo more neurons, synaptogenesis, more glial cells in the Disney world for rats versus in isolation. All right, so let's break this down. As we just talked about, 25% of children uh, experience uh, large swings in IQ test scores, 10%, greater than 10%, I should say, or 10 points on, on the scores. And children who are most likely to see these uh, high fluctuations are children who live in poverty. Uh, they live in unstable homes and kind of traditional stressors that we understood associated with poverty impacting a performance on these IQ test scores. So they can go from, you know, nutrition, inadequate health, health to overcrowding and uh, chronic stress. So chronic stress, kind of broadly speaking, uh, has been uh, associated or found to be associated with uh, IQ test scores. And we've covered in this class it's, uh, the idea of adverse child events, that cumulative measure of, of um, adversity uh, in childhood being associated with all kinds of cognitive health and social outcomes. And it's no difference for IQ test score. Affection and parenting. So uh, poverty obviously is stressful, not just for the child, but also for parents. So which, and that strain on the parents can reduce uh, affectionate uh, parenting, thus uh, contributing to um, negative uh, ch uh, childhood developmental outcomes. So poverty affecting not just the child, obviously, but also, also affecting uh, parents and thus affecting kind of their um, interactions with each other. There's also a lack of opportunity for kind of stimulation slash practice. So uh, the higher class you are, the more opportunities you have um, to interact with resources in your home. So whether it's like a laptop, but also the books um, and various other educational resources and also kind of just the time to interact with your child. So maybe you're not working two jobs or maybe you're just not stressed for working at a job that you hate. Um, or, you know, you get paid less. Uh, you can, there's a difference between working on a job that you don't like, but if you're getting paid, um, you know, at least a livable wage versus working minimum wage, uh, that's going to put uh, additional stress on a parent um, and um, decrease the amount of opportunities and energy kind of uh, in reserves to interact with a child in, in, in ways that uh, stimulate cognitive um, development, thus uh, reducing the amount of kind of practice that the child has interacting with um, complex uh, cognitive tasks, and thus um, potentially um, decreasing their scores on IQ test score uh, tests in rats and rat parks. So this is kind of an example, an animal model example. So kind of the classic understanding of rats in um, animal studies is you know you place you put them in a cage uh, with drugs and they'll just keep uh, and the rat has the ability to self-administer the drugs by pressing a button the rat will just keep pressing the button for example over and over again to get the drugs more um, you know rapidly until they die in some cases um, but future research found that that's actually not always the case and really the environmental circumstances correlate with a rat's uh, willingness to administer those um, self-administered drugs. And it's kind of similar here, rats and rat parks, wherein um, rats in a kind of a living in isolation or a more, de more deprived environment uh, perform less on kind of their, you know, the rat measures of, of, of cognition. And rats who are raised in these uh, rat park, which is kind of like the Disney of rats, uh, where they got all the magical rat things that they love. I don't know, the old food and opportunities to climb, but also live with other rats. You know, they're mammals, they're social, <laughs> they're social species. So um, not living in isolation and kind of in totality, reducing that chronic stress, reducing that deprivation within the environment. And those rats in Rat Park um, experience more uh, neurogenesis, more synaptogenesis, and more glial cells, which uh, help kind of regulate other neurons. Uh, than rats living in isolation. So kind of just a neurological example from animal models that, you know, what we know to be true, that uh, poverty has a negative impact on uh, neuro neurological development and um, by extension uh, performance on particular intelligent tests. The emergence of creativity. Preschool age children display high levels of a divergent thought. Ideation fluency, how many different ideas can be produced, 
increases until uh, third grade, and declines significantly after fifth grade. Originality, ability to produce original ideas, start to decline starting in sixth grade, and could relate to fitting in with groups and or most classrooms teach convergent thinking, know the correct answer. So the emergence of the child of creativity um, is kind of follows a linear growth until uh, children hits um, around fifth grade, uh, where we see um, I, I, uh, ideational uh, fluency and kind of originality declining. And uh, one big reason for that is, in which I've already talked about, is that schools kind of emphasize this convergent way of thinking, that is, finding the correct answer uh, to a particular uh, task, to a particular problem, rather than encouraging um, um, novel ways to think through things, divergent ways of thinking. Um, because we are, especially in Florida, um, well, and across the United States, I should say, as a whole, it's a national trend. But I should say, especially in a Western context, um, an emphasis on uh, standardized testing. So you kind of just have less opportunity uh, in a classroom setting to operate with kind of more ambiguous uh, learning goals. So you have to have, you know, we have to learn X, Y, Z each time, and each X, oh, each uh, comp, uh, comp, uh, part of X, Y, Z has a right and wrong answer, and that's what we're teaching. So but kind of through practice, through time, you may see kind of sleeper effects, that accumulative effect of those cognitive strategies emphasized within a classroom uh, contributing to a decrease in ideational fluency and originality with age. And this kind of goes back to other things that we've talked about throughout this course is that learning is kind of de-emphasized in some regards, uh, especially um, intrinsic motivation and kind of and um, uh, learning goals versus performance goals, where, you know, classrooms are, again, chasing the right, uh, the correct answer, that convergent way of thinking, but also really focusing on grades, that is those performance goals, which over time may decrease, as I stated, um, original ideas being generated uh, among children. The Flynn Effect. It's a phenomenon over the 20th century where the average IQ scores have increased in all countries studied. In the US, there's an increase in three to four IQ points per decade. Countries where rates of infectious diseases are, uh, are, hi uh, are higher have on average lower IQ scores than lower infection countries and may harm brain development and strip body of nutrients. Children today have more formal education, improved nutrition and living conditions. Scores of groups tested in 1932 fell along a bell-shaped curve with half below 100 and half above. Studies show that if children took the same test today, half would score above 120 on the 1932 scale. So this is kind of a very interesting phenomenon uh, in psychological testing called the Flynn effect, as I stated, with each generation seeing kind of an increase in uh, scores on IQ tests. And what we know about kind of evolution, globally speaking, um, is that that's not how that works. You're not going to see massive shifts in the bell curve in a 70-year period of quote-unquote intelligence. So there has to be um, environmental influences impacting uh, performance on these test, uh, IQ test scores. Um, and there are different suspected uh, environmental factors. So some uh, researchers argue that because of the correlation between infectious diseases and lower IQ test scores, uh, that infectious diseases are harming the uh, neurological development of children and, uh, and also kind of stripping their body of nutrients, which are necessary for proper development and proper cognitive development and thus performance on uh, IQ test scores. But you can also imagine a lot of natural co-variation occurring between, uh, within uh, children growing up in a very poor area and all kinds of other uh, factors uh, going on, probably less access to education, not just that there's infections and diseases, but all these other stressors present in their environment, right? Imagine a poor environment. It's not just this one variable occurring in a vacuum, which we've talked about throughout this class, but rather kind of this collection of stressors. Also today, it's um, children have more formal education. So the rates of high school uh, attendance and uh, college attendance and uh, completion of degrees are far higher than what they were 100 years ago. And what does that allow? That allows just more opportunities for children to interact with particular cognitive strategies 
which are emphasized on the task. So literally just kind of a training and, and interacting with um, particular cognitive strategies uh, at more frequent rates, which allows for uh, higher rates of automation, higher rates of myelination to occur with an individual, thus making this uh, 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 performance on task scores or on uh, IQ tests far easier than an individual seeing these tests for the first time, kind of again going back to what, what information, what experience you're bringing to the table. So just more interacting with tests in general, more formal education, more uh, interacting with uh, particular cognitive strategies that are emphasized within these IQ test scores. Also, we see increased, increased living conditions and improved nutrition. Um, uh, some researchers have argued that the decrease in lead in our homes uh, increased uh, IQ test scores and decreased violence and kind of is uh, a huge reason why there is a uh, decrease in violence uh, throughout the decades and an increase in uh, test scores. And that's reflected in the different bell curves, which you can see that uh, the bell curve is shifted to the left. That is, they scored lower uh, 60 years ago. This is a 1932 sample versus a 1997 sample. And you can see a massive shift within a 60 year period kind of reflecting um, the environmental uh, shifts that we, uh, that we talked about and probably other ones as well. And what's interesting is even on tests such as the matrix uh, uh, test, which is kind of thought to be this uh, intelligence test across cultures, they also see evidence of this Flynn effect. So again, kind of the idea of producing a culturally bias free, uh, a test free of cultural bias is very difficult just based on cultural variations and the um, con uh, kind of the strategies uh, employed by cultures because they solve different problems and value different uh, problem solving um, skills within a particular culture. IQ and school performance. Adolescents with high IQs are less likely to drop out of high school than lower IQ peers. Do not predict long-term college achievements as well. Habits, interests, and motivation affect academic achievement. IQ correlates highly with SAT and GRE scores, but GRE scores do not predict graduate school success well. Many universities are dropping the GRE as a requirement. So let's kind of work through this here. We see a correlation between high IQs and uh, dropping out, of, or uh, a correlation between IQ test scores and um, dropping out of high school. And that could be for a whole host of reasons that we've already talked about with IQ being associated with all kinds of environmental factors. So you can imagine a person who's scoring lower on an IQ test score is not, um, is a person who's also experiencing many stressors in their life. Um, it's not just that, oh man, everything is amazing except for my IQ test score. Um, but on average, which we understand from the bell curve, uh, the majority of people who are going to have these lower IQ test scores are going to be inexperienced working with these tasks and kind of experiencing more or higher uh, rates of adversity within their environment. However, we also see that the correlation between uh, IQ test scores and uh, achievement in college and graduate school uh, declining. Uh, that correlation decreasing. And that's because uh, habits, interests, motivation affect academic achievement. So now you're kind of in a pool where everybody has, um, uh, you're in a higher distribution of IQ test scores, and now kind of really to achieve within uh, that particular educational settings, uh, uh, variables such as habits, interests, motivation are, are going to contribute to your success within those environmental um, um, uh, environments. Um, so everybody has more or less kind of the variability of IQ test scores are going to be lower, but uh, among IQ test scores within a university setting, but uh, the variability of interests and habits and motivation are going to be higher uh, within that setting because, you know, theoretically um, the, uh, upper ends of the bell curve distribution of IQ test scores are going to be in college, thus kind of, thus making that a correlation weaker. Now, interestingly, IQ test scores uh, are, are kind of correlated with a GRE test scores, but GRE test scores do not predict a graduate school success well at all. Um, you know, some, something around 50% of grad student, students drop out of, of grad school and many universities, MIT, 
and just kind of the big uh, research universities don't even take GRE test scores anymore because they are thought to be so um, inaccurate in predicting uh, graduate student success. And instead, they rely on other um, more holistic evaluations of students and uh, letters of recommendation, for example. Fostering creativity in adolescence. Ability to elaborate on ideas increases in middle school, and that's one form of creative thinking emphasized in the classroom. May only be effective if, if the person's environment supports and rewards creativity. Environments which allow them a certain degree of independence to explore different fields and acquire knowledge of their chosen field spurs creativity. To become successful, successfully creative in a field, a thorough knowledge base is necessary. So as we talked about, um, one reason that we saw kind of a decrease in originality may be because um, the uh, approaches to learning that are emphasized in the classroom. However, uh, in this case, uh, 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 elaborating on our, our ideas are emphasized in the classroom. Thus, we see an increase in uh, middle school of this form of creativity. So again, kind of these environmental factors um, contributing to uh, the types of creativity that uh, develop in, um, or are more likely to develop, develop, I should say, during adolescence. And again, this is kind of reflective of the cultural values or, or the values or particular skills and values of education and learning more broadly that a culture um, emphasizes. And kind of on that point, um, creativity may only be effective if the person's environment supports and, and, and rewards creativity and which uh, requires kind of a certain degree of independence to explore and acquire knowledge. So uh, again, environments where uh, that allow for that independence, uh, that uh, acqu uh, acquisition of knowledge through self-discovery uh, um, are more likely to produce higher levels of creativity. But it's also important to note that in order to be successfully creative, you have to have a a thorough knowledge base. So just all of a sudden, you know, I don't, I don't know anything about like quantum physics, but I just walk in and then I'm like, okay, well, this is my theory of quantum physics. We're going to be creative with it. Well, if I don't know the prerequisite like um, physics to um, uh, to talk about quantum physics in any meaningful way, I can't possibly be creative. I have to have that foundational uh, set of knowledge in the field to then be creative with the knowledge uh, that I know. I just can't be creative with no knowledge or I'm just wildly speculating um, based on no information. IQ and occupational success. Now the next few slides I, I go through, um, I want to focus on particular aspects of the book that I thought did a kind of a poor job giving the necessary uh, scientific caveats uh, for students who are just going to kind of quickly read this and then move on with our lives. And I'll break down why, but we'll just review uh, what was stated in the book. Uh, general intelligence was significantly related to both income and occupational prestige. Gap between those with higher intelligence and lower intelligence widened. Bright lawyers were more successful or productive than less intelligent peers. Intell intellectual ability was correlated with supervisor ratings. From a meta analysis in the 1970s, trainer training study had one training of skills in a particular workplace. Good citizens of the workplace. Organizational uh, deviance consists of behaviors targeted uh, at the organization and tasks such as theft, sabotage, and shirking, volunteering for overtime and job dedication. Okay, so what I want to talk about here is a couple key points. So general intelligence being associated with both income and economic prestige, which um, um, you know could be expected um, due to what we uh, previously spoke about with uh, poor individuals um, having uh, having uh, higher likelihoods of scoring uh, lower on IQ test scores, thus they're probably and they have higher rates of um, dropping out of high school, thus they're going to probably make less money statistically than their um, individuals who graduate from college and um, also land jobs that have uh, more social prestige within our culture within a particular uh, time period. Um, but I but one interesting note that the author met, uh, wrote was that something along the lines of obviously lawyers are more successful and productive than, quote, less intelligent peers. Uh, well, I went through the studies uh, that were cited and kind of got through a rabbit hole. And this is kind of how it often works in research, research where one research paper says something and uh, they uh, reference a previous study and then... Um, 
over time because they're all quoting each other you kind of just get this uh laddered approach to uh citations and trying to find the original citation um can be kind of quite a pain in the ass because every year someone's citing it or, or citing so at each so there's the original citation then someone cites that and then someone cites the new whoever just cited it and whatever writes a paper and then someone cites whoever wrote that new citation so it actually looks like the date is actually uh, misleading but i found the original date where she pulled this quote and it was actually a meta-analysis from the 1970s uh which had um which looked at intellectual abilities on a particular task with uh ratings of, of uh, from supervisors on um performance uh, on their jobs. So we have an intellectual uh, task um, being correlated with supervisor ratings in the 1970s. And the uh, meta-analysis of from the 1970s included studies from prior to the 1970s. So this is a very old study to kind of just make this claim without the necessary caveats. You can include this study, um, you know, he did, you know, I'm not gonna listen to what I say, but um, I think it, it's um, typically more scientifically, scientifically uh, appropriate to add these caveats that what you're actually measuring here is a rating of, of supervisor ratings in, an, in a, a score on uh, intellectual ability from the 1970s and really studies before the 1970s. Um, which is a completely different historical era than what we're living in now, um, uh, 50 years or so or more uh, later. And they also talked about training, how even in the apps, in the presence of training, that uh, uh, higher, uh, higher uh, intellectual p uh, individuals, and particularly those who kind of are in prestigious uh, white coll collar um, uh, occupations, such as being a lawyer or whatever, um, even in the presence of training, um, uh, those kind of lower workers um, not being as productive or successful as uh, the um, workers who have more social prestige as lawyers. Well, in that study, I looked at that study, and really what they looked at is one, it was a one uh, kind of training session of particular skills within a particular workplace. So hardly this uh, extensive um, training exercise that kind of proves and uh, from you know many years ago uh, that um, is sufficient to prove the claim that um, white collar workers are kind of more successful and productive than um, I'll just say broadly uh, speaking kind of the working class uh, positions um, and you know kind of all the biases built into that uh, uh, statements kind of requires a lot of evidence and really there was not much evidence to support that or the evidence that was provided was quite old and um, kind of mischaracterized. Another uh, quotation from the author was this idea of good citizens and I looked into this and what really what they were talking about here is kind of organize um, the uh, likelihood of theft, sabotage, um, or particular uh, just behaviors um, that uh, supervisors rate as poor behaviors or you know, negative behaviors, but it's also um, understanding the history of liberal relations in this country um, and kind of the adversarial nature of this uh, historical period, um, you can imagine that um, in this contentious area, in this contentious, contentious historical area of liberal relations, uh, the idea of uh, a good citizen could include uh, a much more um, kind of compliant workforce in the eyes of a supervisor, which you know, makes sense. They're trying to uh, increase um, you know, productivity on the workforce. And one interesting uh, kind of idea here is, and you could kind of see where we get into more uh, specifics, the idea of a good citizen being in the workplace, being one who volunteers for overtime and job dedication. What does job dedication mean? for a working class individual on a blue collar job. I mean, I'm not exactly sure, but this is a supervisor rating, but I mean, you can imagine a supervisor uh, decades ago, what, what uh, how they would uh, um, characterize job dedication. You can also imagine it now. 
um, because everybody is kind of working in bad jobs, but also kind of the idea of more specifically volunteering for overtime. So to be a good citizen and having high IQ means that you're more likely to volunteer for overtime. Does that make you a good citizen of the workplace? Well, according to these supervisors, sure. But is that a kind of a global attribute of being a quote unquote good citizen? Not necessarily at, at all, depending on your um, particular uh, political, economic, and cultural views, and and uh, depending on a particular cultural era that you are growing up in. And kind of also the idea here is that uh, this idea that um, occupational success reflects IQ uh, and, and kind of um, particular white collar uh, workers pretty more productive is just not literally just not accurate. Uh, we've seen a labor productivity increase uh, in the last uh, 60, 70 years, as you can see by the chart, but uh, wealth uh, stagnation and uh, income stagnation for the majority of the population for 50 years now, and actually increases in wealth uh, inequality in, in uh, the United States in particular. Uh, so thus, kind of, again, making these kind of broad claims, you have to add some caveats and kind of include more um, empirical sources to make those kind of claims. And uh, I feel like this is, this is uh, where the book did, uh, in particular, a poor job of, of doing so. Another study the uh, textbook talked about was IQ in health. And uh, it was characterized as people with higher IQ scores tend to be healthier and live longer. And quote, uh, providing equal access to health care reduces but does not eliminate social class differences of health. So I went to that study and you can see here that the study is really talking about uh, death rates by educational status for 2 million people in two cancer cohorts. So again, we've kind of used education as a marker of social class, which is one way of uh, measuring class, but that's ne not necessarily co class. Um, so really, it's a little mischaracterization, so we can say, but does not eliminate educational differences in health, a little more uh, accurate. And it's not an access to healthcare study, as I stated right here. This is a study on cancers and health disease. So kind of making the claim that this um, study is evident that um, by eliminating social class differences, using their wording, um, would not, could not, um, um, or I should say that uh, providing equal access to health care does not eliminate social class differences. Health is kind of not even reflective of this paper. That's not what this paper is about. This paper is about measuring uh, cohorts of, of, of uh, uh, health outcomes in particular cancer, or individuals with cancers and heart disease. And in fact, I went through, the, then I read the article, and the author states that the overall decrease in coronary heart disease mortality over the recent period may be due more to access to good uh, medical care than to improvements in risk factor profiles. Numerous data show that both access to medical care and quality of medical treatment differ by socioeconomic status. So really, even the claims of the authors within this study are not even arguing for individual differences um, being the primary or only cause of health differences, but rather um, access to good medical care. And um, the authors also signing numerous studies, quote unquote, uh, that access to uh, care and quality of medical treatment are differ by SES, which is kind of a, another word for uh, social class. Again, kind of uh, the none of these terms are consistently defined, but just kind of going back to so, saying that uh, we can just, for the purpose of this, characterize it as class. Um, so the author is really not even arguing that point. Um, and finally, the author, uh, the final bullet point, successful monitoring and health uh, uh, requires intelligence, which is sure. So kind of, again, kind of this idea here that, yes, you can kind of make that point, but one, the citation that you're using is kind of being mischaracterized here and really does not provide sufficient evidence to make the point that providing equal access to health care, what exactly that means, I'm not exactly sure, uh, would not eliminate class differences in health. That is a kind of a very uh, loaded point and um, uh, one that has uh, insufficient evidence uh, based on the citations that the authors provided us in the text. And continuing on the IQ in health, uh, uh, Subchapter uh, Linda Gottfriedson. Uh, she argues that good health takes more than access to uh, 
to material uh, resources. Good health requires efficient learning and problem solving. So kind of this is, you'll see this uh, author cited multiple times in this section, kind of again going back to this idea that we can't eliminate uh, so, uh, social differences or class differences uh, to health just through uh, uh, access uh, to uh, health care. Presumably, I, 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 it's difficult to understand what access means, but maybe kind of a national health care program, something along those lines. So kind of this idea against um, uh, a particular political policy uh, and, uh, and being against that particular government policy because of an emphasis on individual differences in IQ. Well, uh, I did, did a kind of a deeper dive into this author, and she is listed uh, in the Southern Poverty Law Center um, as, as an individual who uh, uh, practices in kind of a scientific racism. And why I bring this up um, is uh, pretty straightforward, but kind of what I talked about, so kind of just to recap here that making these broad political claims uh, kind of put insufficient evidence. And not just that, but I think, I mean, for me as a translational uh, 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 scientist and a uh, applied scientist, kind of the implications of what it is that you're arguing as a scientist is interesting to look at, and which I talked about throughout this course, and that is, what are the implications of our understanding of human behavior? And in this case, our uh, this researcher, her um, implications for understanding human behavior, and that is more particularly IQ test scores and health outcomes, um, the implications are that she, uh, according to the Southern uh, Poverty Law Center, kind of practices uh, scientific racism that and argues that, quote, uh, racial inequality, especially in unemployment, is a direct result of genetic racial differences in intelligence and relies heavily on money obtained from um, various white nationalist groups. So again, <laughs> you can you kind of see this is a more uh, glaring example, uh, but it's important to understand what it is, how uh, our understandings of human behavior, human uh, development, and um, the interventions at an individual level, at a community level, but also at a national and world levels, how that is wrapped up in our understanding of humanity as a whole, and how we treat each other, and um, kind of just how we interact with the world, not just interpersonally, but as Bronfer, uh, but also at these uh, political, cultural, economic levels, as Brof and Brenner talked about with all those different um, uh, environmental systems interacting with each other uh, to impact development. I want to review a couple other historical examples of uh, the repercussions of a particular under, of, well, if every, of uh, of our understandings of every kind of human phen phenomenon of psychology, and in particular of IQ test scores um, in the United States. And this brings us to the eugenics move uh, movement, which uh, led to worry about, quote, low IQ in certain groups, and, and which led to the eugenics movement. A study found that disproportionate high impact on the Latino population, primarily women and men from Mexico. Forcible sterilization and immigration laws were the most visible impacts on society. In 1927, Buck first bell, uh, sterilization of an 18-year-old, uh, three generations of imbeciles are enough, quote. Immigration Restriction Act of 1924, immigrants, quote, of the lowest grades of intelligence and immigrants who are making excessive contributions to our feeble-minded, insane criminal and other socially adequate classes. So these are uh, laws written in... Um, the uh, you know legislation uh, and also uh, um, uh, court rulings, uh, which reflect uh, a culture's understanding of intelligence. So, if you have a particular view of any psychological concept, uh, be, um, construct, or any behavior, but in this case, uh, intelligence, uh, there are going to be implications of that. There are real-world implications to this. Uh, so, if you believe IQ test scores, you know are are um, in this historical era, um, kind of a, a reaction, I should say, to IQ uh, test scores or particular uh, theories of IQ test scores contributing to this idea that, okay, well, we just have to make it uh, as a society uh, 
uh, create circumstances wherein individuals with low IQ test scores are unable to um, pass on their low IQ test score genetics to future generation, thus making our um, in, uh, populace uh, um, quotes uh, imbeciles. And literally in the court proceedings, uh, arguing on behalf of sterilizing 18 year olds, three generations of imbeciles are enough. So kind of the idea here that these are genetically passed on, um, these IQ test scores, and the only way we can stop it is to just stop um, uh, um, preventing individuals, particular groups of individuals to uh, limit their reproduction. And you can see this, in particular, not surprisingly, uh, this impacted um, uh, uh, particular uh, minority uh, groups uh, disproportionately, poor individuals, and in one study specifically, um, uh, Latino populations were the most uh, negatively impacted um, by this eugenic movement. So kind of a, a racial components, um, a ra racial implication, I should say, to uh, a particular historical era's understanding of IQ test scores. And you can also see this in historical college admission tests. And there's actually a uh, recent uh, uncovering uh, from the University of Texas, uh, kind of blueprint at a high administration level to prevent uh, black uh, students uh, from attending their college. And one way to do that was to uh, set certain uh, test score uh, limits uh, for their university with the explicit understanding that uh, moving the cutoffs around would eliminate X amount of uh, black students from attending their school. And obviously this is a, a 1950s, a time where inter, uh, integration, uh, you know, famous uh, examples of integration uh, are, under, are um, currently uh, are underway in the United States. And um, so it's uh, integration of uh, students who have less um, uh, access to and interaction with particular um, uh, tasks that and um, cognitive um, kind of strategies that are emphasized within particular tasks. So, you know, that inexperience that we talked about before of interacting with tasks will uh, uh, contribute to an individual per, um, performing in a particular way within a task. And we see that increased experience working with those tasks. We see test retest effects. We see, uh, you know, my own personal example of interacting with jury uh, test preparation, and we see the Flynn effect of uh, individuals interacting with these uh, particular cognitive strategies, these particular tasks, increasing tasks, uh, test scores. So kind of one little uh, covert way to go about um, uh, limiting integration of the University of Texas was by setting off or setting particular uh, um, uh, cutoffs within particular uh, college admission tests. So using kind of this college admission test as a kind of an empirical scientific way uh, or a justification to exclude and limit uh, integrations in the 1950s. And you've and actually other uh, um, kind of documents have emerged from other universities using similar tactics. Now let's talk about changes in IQ uh, in the aging process, kind of looking at older adults more. IQ test scores uh, measured at 11 years old remain stable into older adulthood. Recently, born cohorts outperform earlier cohorts. Declines in intellectual abilities are not universal. Some cohorts perform at numerical uh, ability tests or in inductive reasoning. When researchers control for speed, declines on tests uh, are not as steep. So we already talked about that there are generational effects, cohort effects of uh, measures of intelligence. And, but we also kind of see not this general decline in uh, intelligence as uh, individual age, so kind of that stereotypical understanding of intelligence decreasing with age, but rather particular types of intelligence uh, decreasing while others actually increasing or remaining stable. So you can see fluid intelligence, we talked about creative problem solving versus crystallized intelligence, kind of this accumulation of knowledge uh, taking two different developmental trajectories. Also researchers find that when uh, researchers control for speed on a task, the declines in uh, uh, of, of uh, cognitive tasks, so the differences between uh, younger uh, younger uh, adolescents, for example, and older adults, those differences in that in cognitive task performance 
uh, significantly, um, those differences uh, are uh, far uh, less uh, when researchers control for speed or there are no differences at all. So kind of the idea here is that older adults may take a little more time to perform well on the task, but given proper time and when controlling for speed, you know, time um, on a task, older adults often perform a uh, quite compar comparable to, uh, to uh, younger adults on particular cognitive tasks. And what are some predictors of decline in older adults is people who have cardiovascular disease or other chronic illness, illnesses show steeper declines in mental abilities than their healthier peers. This is called the terminal drop. And this could be correlated to an unstimulating unstimul uh, lifestyle where low social status, engage in fewer activities and dissatisfied with their lives. So kind of the idea here is that um, an individual uh, acquires a chronic illness and then maybe they become depressed, maybe they become more socially isolated and thus perform or participate in cognitively stimulating activities and physically as stimulating activities. So they may become more socially isolated, which contributes to kind of a decline in their cognitive abilities because, you know, use it or lose it. Um, so kind of it becomes this... Um, uh, process. That, so these uh, illnesses are contributing to this wider process going on, this collection of other um, factors that, uh, that contribute to uh, declines and um, intelligence uh, with aging. So rather, so rather than this universal process of, of declines of cognition, uh, there is uh, evidence that supports the idea that um, th uh, cognitive exercise, physical exercise, and uh, chronic illnesses interfering with those uh, cognitive and physical exercises, as, as well as social um, um, social activities uh, declining due to uh, th those chronic illnesses contributing to uh, decline in, uh, on performance of cognitive tasks, for example. And the idea here really is just kind of an overall unstimulating life. You're dissatisfied with your life, you're engaging in less activities in your life, and thus you're, um, uh, you're going to experience physical declines as well as uh, cognitive declines. Potential for wisdom. Like every psychological construct, we do not have one definition of wisdom. But let's look at two of them. And the first is from Baltz, which is a constellation of rich factual knowledge about life combined with procedural knowledge, such as strategies for giving advice and, ha and handling conflicts. The Sternberg approach is someone who can combine successful intelligence with creativity to solve problems that require balancing multiple interests or perspectives. Older adults, like younger adults, are more likely to display wisdom if they have had life experiences that sharpen their insights into the human context. Wisdom is developed in social contexts where they have opportunities to discuss problems with someone they value. Supportive social environments during early adulthood is associated with wisdom 40 years later. So kind of the idea here is that uh, these researchers argue that wisdom isn't like the stage-like process, kind of if you remember Piaget, where at each stage, at each kind of stair step, you get these new cognitive abilities, um, that allow you to perform well on particular tasks, in this case, like intelligence, but rather kind of this gradual experience. These researchers argue for a kind of more of a gradual experience-based um, development of wisdom, wherein uh, environments that allow individuals to kind of practice skills typically associated with wisdom, such as problem solving, taking the perspective of others, and kind of coming to compromises and giving sound advice, um, environments that emphasize those skills and allow individuals to practice those skills are more likely to uh, develop wisdom and higher levels of wisdom, uh, kind of just through um, a ex practicing with those uh, in the uh, with those kind of uh, circumstances, and b it the the existence of those opportunities to pra practice those skills kind of reflects a culture that values. Um, that form of intelligence, a.k.a. wisdom. Creative endeavors. Peak times of creativity vary from field to field. Humanity scholars peak in their 60s. Productivity in arts peaks in 30s and 40s. The general idea is that creative behavior is possible throughout the life span. Older adults may just produce less of them. So kind of the idea here is that you just don't hit a certain age and you're no longer able to um, uh, be creative anymore. 
and that thus there's kind of not this universal decline, but rather uh, maybe the frequency of creative endeavors and also possibly maybe particular cultures um, allowing for different periods of creativity. Uh, as we talked about on previous slides in uh, middle school and elementary school, uh, kind of those sleeper effects, those cumulative effects of originality declining. So maybe in cultures that have different uh, understandings of learning that emphasize particular uh, forms of creativity uh, would be expected to see different uh, peaks uh, and different frequencies of creativity throughout the lifespan. Genes in the environment. Some believe IQ test scores, uh, score differences are due to genes. Genetic influence does not mean intelligence is unresponsive to environment or sun and stone. The environment turns on genes and epigenetics impacts IQ test scores. The declining influence of the environment on IQ scores is not universally seen across cultures. Mother's IQ is reliably associated with her children's IQ, but it's difficult to disentangle prenatal environments or intergenerational genetic expression. So kind of the idea of here is that going back to our behavioral genetics discussion, um, the limitations of uh, behavioral genetics that we've talked about in length, and that is that it's difficult to measure the impact of the prenatal uh, environment on uh, children's uh, IQ test scores and also um, intergenerational genetic expression. So kind of this intergenerational trauma that we see in populations that experience a horrific uh, trauma. So for example, the Dutch famine, uh, we see kind of genetic markers of the, of, uh, the uh, Dutch famine generation, uh, generations following the famine, or generations um, uh, in, into the future following uh, the famine. And also uh, the idea that uh, IQ test scores, um, that there's a declining influence of the environment on IQ test scores is actually not seen across all cultures. That was traditionally thought to be a universal case. So kind of this idea here is that yeah, genes um, are believed to have uh, some impact on, on uh, IQ test scores, but what that actually means and, uh, is uh, still not understood fully. So for example, adverse child events in environmental stre stre stressors predict IQ test scores. It's a cumulative effect, that is, the more you add, the faster you drop. And you can see here that even individuals who start off with this, almost the same uh, IQ test score, individuals who are uh, in higher classes, that is characterized here as high SE or, uh, SES, um, end up with higher, uh, performing better on IQ uh, tests than their um, lower class peers, even though they uh, began at more or less the same exact IQ test score. And this is kind of the idea here that the environment's again impacting the um, uh, performance on IQ test scores and then that there's a cumulative effect. That is the more uh, stress you, you add to an individual, the higher likelihood they are to perform lower on uh, intelligent tests. And next, the cumulative de uh, deficit hypothesis. And this is uh, argues that negative effects accumulate over time. And early childhood stunting in the number of people living in absolute poverty uh, are, are uh, used in uh, some studies to indicate um, uh, adverse uh, cognitive development. Both our indicated indicators are closely associated with poor cognitive and educational performance and conservatively over 200 million children under five years are not fulfilling their developmental potential. And the idea here is that um, individuals have a set uh, or kind of a, uh, a range of developmental potential. And this is kind of related to this Vykalsky uh, developmental range theory or the Fisher developmental range uh, theory of, of development, uh, wherein uh, individuals who receive optimal de uh, development are, are uh, most likely to reach the, um, the highest level of their developmental range, while individuals who experience no to very limited um, enriching environments are uh, most likely to uh, develop in their lower uh, range of, de of kind of developmental possibilities. And one way to look at this is researchers at Lancet uh, kind of looked at stunting, as I, as I stated, and children living in absolute poverty to kind of get a rough estimate of children who are not fulfilling uh, their developmental potential. And they were unable to look at each uh, every country, but their conservative estimate that when this uh, article was written, and this was 15 years ago, um, 
that, um, or I should say some of the data from 15 years ago, uh, was that uh, children, uh, about 200 million children under the, the age of five are not fulfilling their developmental potential. And you can see this kind of a, a conceptualization, a little schematic uh, to the right of this, and that's uh, individuals having um, different ranges of uh, developmental potential and the uh, quality of the environment uh, increasing uh, and contributing to the realization of that uh, developmental potential with deprived average and enriched environments uh, in this schematic example. Exploring other environmental influences on IQ, those who think IQ is fixed tend to take fewer economic risks, challenging themselves less. The amount of schooling seems to exert a casual, uh, causal influence on IQ. IQ drops during summer vacation. Students who drop out of high school have lower IQs than those who complete, even when they start with the same IQ in high school. Uh, early intervention programs, hit card, produce short-term increases in IQ and reduce the likelihood of being held back in school as well as high school dropout rates. Expectancy effects, tendency of researchers to unintentionally, unintentionally influence the outcome of studies, the Harvard test of inflicted acquisition, bloomers versus others, but really randomly assigned. The 20% labeled as bloomers scored about four points higher than the other students when measured a year later. All right, so there's a lot here to unpack. Uh, so going back to this idea of fixed intelligence, that is, uh, you're born with a certain IQ and there's basically nothing you can do to uh, change it. It's kind of like this, um, kind of almost like this predestination uh, developmental trajectory. Well, um, unsurprisingly, individuals who hold uh, that idea of uh, IQ, of intelligence, uh, are uh, less likely, or they, they tend to take uh, fewer academic uh, risks and they challenge themselves less. And it kind of is straightforward, right? Because what's the point? Why would I take more risks? Why would I challenge myself? Because these abilities are locked in stone. There's really nothing you can do about it. And moving on, we see that um, schooling has an impact on IQ. And we see this across cultures, that each year of schooling is kind of typically associated with, uh, it depends on the study, but two to uh, three or two to five uh, IQ test score points. And you also see this reflected in the United States when IQs drop during summer vacation. And you especially see this for in, uh, uh, individuals in lower classes where they're probably going to spend less uh, time um, uh, performing and practicing particular cognitive skills during the summer and more time, you know, just goofing around, which is fine. But also um, the overall... Um, uh, interactions with uh, cognitively stimulating material, which are necessary for development and other types of development, are are you know it's uh, are important um, for uh, developmental outcomes and also performance on these IQ test scores. And uh, students who drop out of high school have lower IQs than those who complete, even when they start with the same IQ in high school. And this is kind of similar to what we just talked about that you can put individuals. Uh, individuals with the same exact IQ uh, test score at the beginning of high school and then uh, look at their IQ test scores at the end of high school and uh, compare their likelihood of dropping out. And we see that uh, individuals who have uh, a lower IQ, who, are, who kind of saw a dip or stagnation in, in their IQ, um, uh, showing increases in the likelihood of dropping out. And again, this is kind of reflective of the fact that these environmental inf uh, influences accumulating over time uh, and contributing to not just performance on IQ test scores, but a um, real world consequences, in this case, dropping out of high school. And one, uh, one study that I really wanna highlight is this Harvard test of inflected acquisition. So kind of the idea what this was is they went to, Harvard scientists went to some um, elementary school and they went to some teachers and say, oh, okay, well, I've, I've administered some tests to these elementary students and I've, um, we've determined that 20% of these students um, are bloomers and they have IQ uh, test scores who are higher than, uh, are higher than, um, uh, other students who aren't the bloomers, so the non-bloomers, the regulars. Um, so uh, just you know, keep that in mind. These are the smart kids, and whatever, keep that in mind. But really, what they did was 
they never actually found any differences between bloomers and the rest of the population. They were just children randomly assigned to two different groups, and they wanted to see if there was an expectancy effect wherein I tell the teacher that this group is, you know, amazing, the best, the smartest. Will that impact, will that actually produce developmental differences as measured by on IQ test scores? And what the researchers found was that there was a difference. And specifically, the uh, children who were labeled as bloomers, that 20% of children, uh, they actually scored four high Q IQ points higher than the other students when measured a year later. So creating this expectancy effect. So maybe the teacher's interacting with the students in a different way. Maybe the school treating them different. Maybe their parents um, learning that their child is like this gifted child. And if just under the right conditions are really going to break through, they're really smart. So maybe they buy... Uh, more educational materials, maybe they interact with the child more, uh, enroll them in more cognitively stimulating activities, uh, thus kind of creating this uh, self-fulfilling prophecy, and in this case, this expectancy effect of, of uh, IQ test scores. Race and ethnicity. Most studies find racial and ethnic differences in IQ scores. However, those are group averages. Most research does not find evidence for a genetic difference between races. A study conducted in Germany shortly after World War II compared the IQ test scores of children of American, of black American soldiers and white German mothers with the children of white American soldiers and white German mothers. In both groups, mothers raised their children, and there are no differences in IQ test scores. Other studies have examined whether black Americans with white European ancestry obtain a, quote, boost in IQ relative to those with fewer white European ancestors which would be expected if racial differences were genetic. However, no differences in IQ test scores were found. So kind of the idea here is, yes, there are differences found in, in particular IQ test scores, but for a whole host of reasons that we discussed about and one that we're about to get to. And this is also at the group uh, average level. Now, interestingly, if there was a genetic um, uh, influence and a kind of a, a genetic causal um, impact on IQ test scores, you would expect to find that in and in, in, um, in, uh, in children who have different uh, racial backgrounds. So in this study of, of uh, World War II, um, uh, well, children of World War II veterans, um, there were two groups of children looked at, both of which were raised by their mothers. And the two groups consisted of one uh, group with, uh, one group had a uh, white mother, uh, German, a uh, white German mother and a black American father, and another group had a white um, American uh, father and a white German mother. And kind of this theory of, you know, genetic uh, um, racial differences um, kind of acting as this uh, genetic determinant to IQ test scores, you would expect to see the uh, children with um, uh, two white parents scoring higher than a, uh, the mixed child. But that was not found in the research at all. Again, it's so providing strong evidence that there is not uh, kind of a genetic determinant, a racial uh, genetic uh, determinant of IQ test scores. Also research uh, looking at individuals with um, uh, different levels of, of, of black and white relatives. Uh, you can compare um, individuals who have uh, more uh, white ancestry uh, compared to individuals with more black ancestry. And when you look at the differences between uh, those groups to see if there's a quote unquote boost in IQ based on uh, racial differences, there was there is no differences. There is no IQ boost in IQ in uh, IQ test scores. Again, providing evidence um, that to support the idea that there is not this kind of genetic deterministic uh, difference uh, in intelligence that impacts IQ test scores, but rather historical uh, differences um, uh, which are reflective of, in, of uh, disenfranchisement uh, and uh, interacting with particular cognitive strategies and also the effects of, of poverty, of class differences, which is highly correlated with uh, race in the United States. And the last uh, concept that I want to talk about is stereotype threat, which is a fear that one will be judged to have the qualities associated with negative stereotypes. A meta-analysis on SAT test scores found stereotype threats account for 40 points, of the, 40 points of the score gap between white, black, and Hispanic students. Mentors increase task performance. So kind of the idea here is that if you were to, um, the, well, the presence 
or in the fear that a particular individual will uphold these negative stereotypes associated with that particular person's um, group, whether that's racial, uh, uh, gender, or old age. Um, kind of creates a self-fulfilling prophecy where you end up actually um, performing on a task in a way that um, uh, fulfills those uh, negative stereotypes because you're so paranoid about performing that, about performing uh, negatively that you end up actually performing negatively. And a meta-analysis has found support for this idea with uh, 40 uh, points um, being, uh, or, or the stereotype threat being associated with, on average, a 40-point uh, decline uh, in uh, SAT uh, test scores. Interestingly, uh, the findings from stereotypes threats do vary, and there has been some replication issues, but really it's, um, you have to, uh, I think uh, researchers argue that um, this is reflective of kind of a historical era you live in and the particular and the um, particular factors within a given environment. So obviously the negative stereotypes about groups change with time um, and different environments are going to emphasize. Uh, particular uh, stereotypes more than others, and thus kind of increase or decrease the um, the strength of that stereotype threat, um, not just in the direct environment, but also kind of in, in a particular historical era. All right, so that's all there is uh, for this week. Thanks for everyone for tuning in, and have a great week, and I will see you next week. Bye.